From the book of Judges, please, I'm reading from the fifth chapter, and I'm reading starting the 28th verse. This passage or this scripture is given in the song of Deborah. Deborah was a judge and a prophetess of Israel. She was one of the greatest women maybe that's ever lived. She had tremendous faith in God. And it's a strange statement, but as the other statements she made were prophetic, this one was factual, of course, also. The book of Judges, chapter 5, beginning with the 28th verse, the mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? I want to use the scripture again. Read it again. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? I want to use for a subject, preaching a few moments, a few minutes, the mother who waited. This mother waited in vain. I'm concerned that many today wait in vain. But you don't really have to. The mother who waited, would you bow your heads please? Heavenly Father, as we stand here before these people, we do so in the holy name of Jesus. We would ask that you would help us to speak, to minister thy way and thy word under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We believe thee, we praise thee, and we love thee. And in the mighty name of Jesus, that your word would go to every heart. I do not know the several needs of these people, but thou knowest. And I would ask that in the name of Jesus, that your spirit would deal with those that are young, that their children are small, and that hand, O oh God, of love and responsibility can form the young into thy pathways of righteousness if it will only do so. Help us to speak, O oh God, that we may say that which we ought to say, and we will ask it all in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen. It's a bad thing to raise a boy or a girl without the fear of God in their lives. And if America is facing catastrophe, if America is facing a generation of young people that the great percentage are on drugs, so many more are addicted to alcohol, so many and so great a percentage of its youth that know so very little about integrity, about values, about character. And God knows so few do. The blame must be laid at the doorstep of the home. I don't like to sound critical or condemnatory, but that's a fact. Somebody said there are three great institutions in the world that God created. The church, the home, and the state. God ordains government. It's His will that government exist. Of course, bad government is not in the will of God, but government per se is in the will of God. And naturally, the church is in the will of God, but actually, it was the home that God first ordained in the Garden of Eden as the first great divine institution, the home. It is so very important, God created Adam and Eve, and then later on gave them children, and the tremendous responsibility that rests upon the mother and the dad started at the very foundation of the creation of God in this world. 
It came before the church. It came before the state. So consequently, no nation, even the church, cannot rise above the degree of the responsibility of the home. Now, I stood not long ago in Israel, and I remember standing at the very spot of the scene or the site of the Scripture. I remember looking at one of the most beautiful valleys that I have ever seen in all of my life where that crops are grown 12 months out of the year. I looked at Mount Tabor that is mentioned in this particular passage. And my mind, of course, went to many things, but primarily it went to this happening that I read to you this morning. Deborah was the prophetess of God, the judge of the tiny nation of Israel. God spoke to her heart and told her that she was to take some 10,000 men. Really, he told her to tell Barak, a mighty man in Israel, under her to take the men and to fight Jabin, the king of the Canaanites. She called Barak to her and he declined to do so. He said, I will do it if you will go with me. If you will not go, I will not go. She told him, I will do it. But because of your position, the credit for the victory will go to a woman and not to you. Now this, the outcome of this conflict looked hopeless. For one of the mightiest generals on the face of the earth in that day was named Sisera. He was the field marshal of Jabin, the king of Canaan. The thing that made him so powerful was he had 900 chariots of iron. It was like an army today that would have the greatest number of tanks. And in reality, it was like an army that would have the, a tremendous number of tanks and another army that was meeting it not having any whatsoever. This was the condition of Israel. And yet Barak had been told by Deborah the prophetess to meet Sisera and Jabin on the field of battle, and victory would be theirs. Have you noticed that God very seldom ever takes on in an even conflict? Always he is outnumbered, grossly so. But in reality, he isn't. In reality, there be more with us than be with them. In reality, the power is on our side. You see, there is much evil in the world today, but soon righteousness will prevail. There is much wickedness in the world this morning, but wickedness will not always prevail. One day righteousness shall cover the earth, and the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So it's going to triumph. Righteousness shall. Now when Barak met Jabin and Sisera, the Bible said Sisera brought his 900 chariots of iron. I want you to figure in your mind's eye and see this tremendous number of chariots, 900 of them, pulled by the finest horses in that part of the world. There was no army that could stand against it. Even mighty Egypt was fearful of Sisera. The Bible said he had terrorized Israel for 20 years. That's a long time. Twenty years the highways were unoccupied. Twenty years the people of God walked in fear and trembling and, and, and had no means of victory. Twenty years. And now God said it's time. And the Bible said that whenever they joined in conflict, 10,000 Israelites against six or 900 chariots of iron plus possibly nearly a hundred thousand soldiers, hopelessly outnumbered. 
grotesquely outnumbered, horribly outnumbered. But all of a sudden, God started to fight from the heavens against Sisera. All of a sudden, the very stars in their courses fought against Sisera. I crossed the little, I don't know if you would call it a river. It's small by the standards of the Mississippi. It's probably not any wider than from here to those microphone stands, but it's the Kishon River. Very small. I don't know if this, it's the same course now. Maybe the course has changed. Maybe the direction has changed from that day to this. But it's in that general vicinity. And all of a sudden, great hailstones started falling from the heavens. Jagged forks of lightning and the peals of thunder that rolled across the sky. Torrents of slashing rain begins to roll down upon that valley of Megiddo. And that Keshon River ceases to be just a small little rivulet or stream and it grows and widens as the water rolls down it from the torrent of rain. And it caught Sisera and those 900 chariots of iron and chariots of iron don't swim very well. And when the conflict was ended, Sisera alighted from his chariot, the Bible said, and ran into a tent. A woman was there by the name of Jael. She was the wife of Habor the Kenite. He thought that this woman is on good terms, her husband is on good terms with, with my king, and I will be safe here. And he told her, he said, I'm weary, I cannot go any longer, and if anyone comes and asks if a man is here, you tell them no. Totally exhausted, he falls down. She throws a blanket over him there under her tent. But she did something he didn't expect her to do. She went and got a nail. This was God's greatest adversary, Sisera. And she got a hammer, and he was lying on his side. And she put that nail to his head, raised that hammer back, and he was sound asleep, but he would never wake. And when she brought the hammer down, it hit the top of the nail, and the nail went through his head, and he died. He died not on the field of battle, but at the hands of a woman. Now, you women today experience great freedom, but in those days, for a warrior to die at the hands of a woman was tantamount to an insult from the gods of war, whoever they were. And whenever Deborah started to lead the people of Israel in a great convocation, and they began to rejoice because of the tremendous victory that was won, it happened just like she said. She told Barak, you will not get the credit. It will go to a woman, and it did. And then in the course of Deborah's song, she sang, the mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariot? Not a single solitary man in this world that has ever done anything great for society or God but 99% of the time, the hand of their mother molded their lives in their childhood. That's a fact. Molded it, sculptured it, fashioned it. And every single man that has wrecked havoc on the earth, the lack of parental leading and development toward God, cause the difficulty that was in that life. It's difficult to imagine an Adolf Hitler as having a mother, isn't it? It's difficult to imagine a Joseph Stalin that, that murdered untold thousands as having a mother, isn't it? It's hard to comprehend Adolf Eichmann the, under Adolf Hitler that slaughtered six million Jews. A beast. It's hard to, to, to comprehend a Nero 
that illuminated Rome at midnight with the burning bodies of Christians like the noonday sun was shining on it. It's hard to imagine a Nero having a mother, isn't it? But they did. But if you will look back in history, every one of these, the Hitlers, the Hamans, the Herods, the Neros, the Attila, the Hans, and the millions of others, they had a serious deficiency in their upbringing because it's not so much the dad as it is the mother that molds the child. It's the wife, it's the mother with a hand that molds that little fella. He is close, she is closer to that particular individual than anyone else. And it's that mother that guides and leads and strengthens that that child may be raised in the ways of righteousness. I ask a question this morning. How many, how many godly parrots are there in the United States of America? No one knows. How many that, that love the Word of God with all of their hearts, especially the mothers, how many in this nation? No one knows. How many that attend church that raise their children in the fear of God? No one knows. But the facts are the number is very small. The facts are the percentage is very, very little, very, very small in comparison to the aggregate. Not many. That's the reason for, for the, the lack of character and integrity. That's the reason for the young people in the condition they're in today. You know the thing that saved the United States of America back 100, 150 years ago? The men, by and large, trying to carve out a nation out of bare wilderness, so many times were, were drunkards and, and, and gamblers. and every, Oh, there were exceptions, naturally, but it was the pioneer woman that, that said we're going to raise the family in the fear of God, that instill the words of God in the hearts and the lives of the children. It was the mother that did it. It was the mother that said, no, our family is not going to the dogs. Our family is going to serve God. It was the mother. This new United States of America wouldn't be here today probably as it is were it not and had it not been for Abraham Lincoln. But this man that had such a compassion and such a wisdom and such a knowledge gave the credit to his mother. She died when he was just a boy. But she molded him the short time of her life, his life, that she had with him. And he credited his, his integrity and his character to her, and who could doubt it? I, I know Jimmy Swaggart. A lot of things I know I don't like. But whatever is there that has responsibility and integrity and character, I have to give the credit to my mother. She went home to be with the Lord, 1960. And I remember so many things about her, but, but one thing basically that I'll never forget was her total, what word can I choose? Her hatred for sin. I mean, she never would. How can I phrase it? Whenever I did wrong, she never laughed about it. Never. Sometimes I would want her to, but she never did. I want her to do all the time, but she never did. Period. She hated wrongdoing. She hated a lie. She hated sin. She hated anything that was wrong. I had a bunch of cousins around me, some that went to the heights in the music business and almost and did destroy their lives. Whenever they would do something wrong, their mothers would laugh and say, well, you know, not all of them, but some of them, you know, make fun of it or just make light of it. But my mother, my mother, she never did smile. I knew she wasn't going to smile. I knew when she found out that I'd done something wrong, she wouldn't pass it off. I knew how her face would look. And I knew if things got out of hand, she would grab a broom after me. I knew that. I remember when I first started playing music, 
I remember we, we entered, Jerry Lee and myself entered a talent show. And it was the forerunner of the old Ted Mack Amateur Hour. I don't know how many musicians were there. I mean, they were, we got there, we found out that they were, uh, we were two kids and we were competing, in, p- competing against the adults. Must have been 30 or 40 mus- musical teams or whoever they were there. And uh, as I said, we were just kids. I think we must have been about, about 14 years old, something like that. And when we walked out to the instruments and played, well, to make the story short, we, we, we won the prize. We, we got whatever they were giving away. And going home that night, I'll never forget it. I was with Jerry Lee and his dad and his mother, and his dad was saying, did you see their faces? Did you see those people? Did you, did you sense their reaction? They were not like you here this morning. They were awake. <laughs> he said, did you, did you see that? He said, did, did you see it? And of course, everybody was ecstatic. The car, I don't know, other people there that I don't remember. But the crowds had been literally just... Uh, triumphant in their mood and they'd surrounded us after the place it must I don't know how many hundreds of people the place was it was this large or and packed to capacity and and we were just kids and we were bowled over by their attitude we didn't realize what the situation would be we took I don't know it was a prize of 25 50 dollars or something Jerry Lee and I divided it and uh, going back we were almost in a state of shock because I remembered the, the response and the reaction of those people. And I didn't tell Mama about it, though. She knew I was going to play in some kind of talent show that night, but I dressed it up. And I kind of, uh, you know, didn't let her know what it was, really. Above all, I didn't want her to know what I played. And I'm not telling you what I played. It's none of your business. But I, sometime later, she found out about it. And I could get by a little bit if there was time between the act and when it was found out. Time heals all wounds. But I don't know, it must have been three or four months, somebody told her that we won. I didn't tell her. I never said a word. I was, my heart was bursting with excitement. I was so thrilled and happy I didn't know what to do, but I didn't dare tell Mama. Somebody said your mother would have been so thrilled. I know most Christian mothers today would. I know that. But my Mama wasn't. And I didn't say anything, praying to God she wouldn't find out. It wasn't a dance or anything like that. It was a talent show. But the song I played and the song I won the money with, you don't sing in church. You don't sing in the choir. You don't sing it behind a podium to bless people. God only forbid what it was. I won't tell you. I was a wayward boy you know, fighting against God and everything else. And about three or four months later, she found out what I, she found out we'd won. She said, you didn't tell me. I said, I tried to change the subject. I I said, no, no, I didn't. I was about 14 years old. I said, did you hear what happened to school the other day? She said, you didn't say a word about winning that talent show. Why? Why didn't you tell me? I said, oh, it, it wasn't anything, nothing, nothing. What did you play? I was waiting for that one. I knew what she was going to ask. I said, uh, oh, (laughs) Jimmy, what did you play? Did you play Jesus Hold My Hand? No. (laughs) Did you play the old rugged cross? No, no, no. What did you play? 
her voice started to rise. She was a little woman, but she could get, her voice sounded like she was larger when she got angry. What did you play? She started suspicioning now. I guess I'm going to have to tell you what I played because it's to finish the thing. I said, she said, did you play Jesus' whole night? No, 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 no. Keep on the firing line? That was real up-tempo, and that would have been good. No, no. I want to know what you played. Mama, you don't know the song. <laughs> that was right. She didn't know it. <laughs> I don't care, young man, and she wasn't smiling. I don't care. I want to know what you played. Boy, I was in a hot spot. I could look down on her head. I was head and shoulders taller than she was. Somebody said, I can't do a thing with him. You ought to have my mama. <laughs> She'd never read Dr. Spock. She'd never heard of old Spock. She'd read Dr. Spank, though. <laughs> She'd read that one good and proper. I want to know what you played. Pointed her finger at me. I said, Mama, if you don't tell me what you played, I'll box your jaws. That was her favorite statement. I'll box. I don't know where they got the word box, but I'll box your jaws. And when she got through, you, you knew it was box, too. I'll box your jaws. I said, Mama, I played the song called Wine. She said, I didn't hear you. Oh, Lord, I'm ashamed to say this. I, it was called Wine. That was the name of the song. I've never tasted the stuff in my life, but I played that song called Wine. Made her so mad. She said, if you ever play that again, boy, I'll whip you to an inch of your life. Me, 14 years old, six feet tall, I'll whip you to an inch of your life if you ever play it again. But she didn't take the, I'm saying all of that to say this, she didn't take the attitude. You know, it's boys will be boys. You are going to live right. And I am going to set the standard before you. And I remember whenever I received an invitation to come play in a nightclub, I was 15 years old. They offered me enough money, it sounded like, a, it, it sounded like a, the whole world was rich. I was working one day a week, still in school, of course, playing, uh, um, um, working for my grandfather in a grocery store. I think I was making $4 on, on a Saturday, that was it. Of course, you remember, this was back a long time ago. And... And... Uh, this man comes in, says, I'll give you, and he named, oh, my mercy, something like $100, which would now like 1000 for one night. And I, I, the thing that hit me was my mother. My mother. I knew she wouldn't stand for it. I knew that there was no way in the world. It was absolutely hopeless. It was no point in even considering it. It was no point in thinking about it because I knew what mother say that was the that was the hand that she had over my life and thank god she did because i was headstrong i was i was bent on doing what i wanted to do myself and it didn't make it my dad was very firm with me man when he said he would whip me he did it but it was my mother that i was i don't know what what words you would use but i looked at more so than even my mother or dad I looked at my mother and it was her intoleration of sin I firmly believe that that kept me in line Jerry Lee's mother would would laugh whenever he did something wrong he was playing in a nightclub when he was 15 years old she thought it was a big joke and I would kind of chafe because my mother, her sister, took the opposite tact. But I look back today and thank God a million years she did. Thank God she did because it was that in those formative years when, when as a gangly 12, 14, 15, 16-year-old boy, headstrong to do things that were wrong, my mother held me there before God. My mother, many times I would awake in the wee small hours of the morning and hear her crying to God at 2 and 3 a.m. Hear her praying and crying before the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, it was her consecration. 
totally dedicated to God. That set an example before me that I'll never forget. I never heard a curse word, God forbid, come out of my mother's lip in all of my life, her mouth and from her lips in all of my life. Never, ever heard it. I never saw her with a cigarette between her fingers. I never saw her with a cocktail glass in her hand. I never saw her in a pair of shorts in all of my life. Never. I never saw her in a pair of slacks in all of my life. Period. She she wasn't holy because she didn't do those things, but she had it in her heart. It was not just legalism. She had it in her heart. The countless times I would come in from school, as a teenage boy, and I would walk in the house, and nobody would be there but Mama, and, and, and she wouldn't even know I was coming in, and she would be somewhere in the house, and most of the time the kitchen. How many times have I stood, and I can see it in my mind's eye this morning, standing in the doorway between uh, one room, there, whatever it was, and the kitchen. Our kitchen and dining room was all together. And I would stand there. There was no door there, just, just an opening. And my mother would be at the kitchen sink, and this was before the days of automatic washers and automatic uh, dishwashers and all of those automatic compactors and all of those things. And my mother would be at the kitchen sink, and she would be singing. She would be, she would be singing one of the old songs of glory, and she could sing. She would be singing, near the cross, there's a precious fountain. The other day when Fred started to sing that song, uh, draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. How many times have I walked to a door and I've stood in that door and the power of God would be on her so strong as she would be there alone, lifting up her voice, washing dishes, singing, or whatever she was doing, and and, and chill bumps would break out all over my arms. Roots of my hair would literally tingle as I would stand there and shake all over, tremble all over. Tears fill my eyes as a gangly teenage boy as the anointing of the Holy Ghost would flow through her. That's consecration. When you're raised in that type of atmosphere, you don't get away from it. You listening to me? You don't get away from it. Mothers, if your boys and girls see you doing an awful lot of things, it will have little influence on them. But for God's sake, for their sake, for eternity's sake, live such a life that even though you won't know it, they will observe you and the touch of God in your life. You hear what I'm saying? But they will observe it. They will see it. What are you saying, Jimmy Swaggart? I'm saying turn off love of life. I'm saying turn off General Hospital, for God's sake. Turn it off. Turn it off and and have a time before God. Have your children ever heard you pray? Have they really ever heard you seek God with sobs and tears? I asked that question. I don't want you to answer it. It wouldn't do you any good to answer me anyway. And I'm sure many of you hear that they have. I don't mean God bless the food. I don't mean, you know, now lay me down to sleep and I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But I mean to where that, that they, have, they have heard you as you have sobbed out before God that which was in your heart, not just one time, but over and over and over again. That's what I'm talking about. I don't care how hot the fires of hell rage. I don't care the pressures that darkness bring to bear upon children. When they have a mother like that, they're going to stay within the fold. I believe that with all of my heart. Hell may rage against them, but that's a foundation and that's a shadow that they'll never get out from under and thank God for it. Then her, her compassion for others. I, she, she had a, a compassion. I guess you were born with it, I suppose. She loved people. And I was raised in that atmosphere, a tenderness in her heart. She could, she could make a rank stranger 
lover in a matter of, of, of minutes. Somehow she could get into people's hurt and their need. And I'd like to think, and oh God, I fail so miserably, but I'd like to think that a little bit of that compassion somehow rubbed off on me. I'd like to think it did. I know just last week, we, we had, well, really it was, it was I guess, Friday, yes. A, a letter came into our office among the thousands of others, and it was read. And it finally got to, to my secretary, and, and a lady and her husband had come to the meeting in Houston. They lived in Houston, but they'd come to Houston, and she was dying with cancer. And I don't mean... Cancer's bad in any stage, but I mean the doctors that said that's it, told her husband, take her home, do the best you can for her. She won't live three months, and she's now lived, I think, about nine months, but they said she can't make it. She's got cancer. She's 38 years old, something like they call black cancer. Tumors on the outside and inside of her body by the scores. Two little girls, 10 years old, 13 years old. She went to Donnie, and Donnie said after, right after service, my dad will pray for you. She'd come for prayer. And somehow or another, we have to have at least 200 ushers, and we're going to have a meeting next week to rectify these things. And sometimes they don't know what to do, and, and, and she went to one of them, and he told her, no, Brother Swagger can't pray for you. I don't know what in the world he was thinking, but he did. She and her husband left. I didn't know anything about it period. And Donnie thought she I had prayed for her. We did pray for many there. I don't know who she got to. Last week in, in Kansas City, one of them, when Junior tells them not to let anybody in, they take it seriously. Flo tried to get in. They wouldn't even let her in. <laughs> She's the lady that helps us with the whatever. And uh, she like not got in, but, but they finally let her in. But anyway, she wrote a letter. She wrote a very kind letter. She wasn't bitter or mean, but I finally heard about it, and it tore my heart out. I thought, God, that's our business. That's what we're for. I, I called, I had Stella to call the, call Houston. We had her name, and to try to, try to get in touch with her, and it was an unlisted number. And the operator said, no, we, we can't, we can't bother them. It's an unlisted number, and you can't talk to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll do it this way, go through a whole rigmarole of red tape, and if she wants to then we'll give you your, her, your number and she can call you back, which all of that happened, and she did. And I told my wife, I, I said, I, I have got to get in touch with that woman. I don't care what it takes, what, it, what happens, I've got to do it. And it was something inside of me that just tore my heart out, and, and she did call back, and I was able to talk with her for nearly a half an hour, and pray with her beautiful spirit one of the sweetest spirits you would ever in your life encounter and I, I told her I said dear sister and and I the presence of God was so real and I I was talking on the phone with that woman and I can't still can't get her out of my mind I've never seen her never met her but I I, I thought God what a spirit Somebody said, well, surely she would be that way because she's dying, but I've seen some that wasn't, see. But such a beautiful spirit. And when we, when we prayed for her and the Spirit of God flowed through her, and I asked her whenever we finished, I said, can we send you anything at the office? She said, Brother Swaggart, I'd give anything in the world for one of those ladies' Bibles, but I... We, We've, we, we, everything we've got has been spent. I said, it'll be there Monday morning. We'll ship it plus anything else you want. In Honduras, I looked at a man that held his baby. No roof over their head. No place to live. One among thousands there. A situation, even though it's much smaller in scope, 75, 80,000 Newsweek said, but as, as bad as East Africa. The baby was sick. 
it threw up over its father. And the look of total helplessness on that man's face. Total helplessness. I can't get things like that out of my mind. Somebody asked me the other day, why do you do this? Why, why, why down there in Central America or East Africa or wherever you are to try to do that? That's not preaching the gospel, someone said. And my answer was this. Were Jesus here, what would he do? What would his heart be? I told one of our missionaries in Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras. He took me aside, and he's a, he's a man, I, I can't tell you how great he is before God. But anyway, he said, could you help me? He said, I'm, I'm, I've started a little clinic, and it was, it was as, as barren as you, you could think of. But he said, there are multiple thousands of these people here, most of them little children. They don't have anything. They're living on the ground. This is not in the place we visited. This is in the capital city, and it was bad. He said, I've got a doctor. And he said, if we can get some type of little mobile unit to go to these places to treat these people. And I told him, I said, you get the price, and we'll see what we can do about it. I'd like to think that some of that compassion, of course it comes from God, but some of it came from my mother, for that was the kind of love that she had. The last time I saw her alive in this world, it was very symbolic. The mother of Sisera looked out a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariot? He would never come home. She would never see him again. He was dead. The last time I saw my mother, she was dressed. We were leaving. I had told her goodbye. Francis was with me. Donnie was with me. This was 21 years ago. She came out to the car. We were on our way to Alabama to start a, a meeting. And she'd already told us goodbye, and I didn't know why she was coming back again. I rolled down the window. I had an Oldsmobile. Then rolled down the window, and I asked her if she came up to the window, I said, and she'd waved me down. We'd started back in the car out to leave. We were late already. I said, what is it? She said, really nothing. I just wanted to tell you goodbye. Of course, God planned it. This would be the last time I would ever see her. She put her head in the window. She kissed me. She kissed Francis and put her arms around Donnie. And... The last words in the world I ever said to her, I said, Mama, I'll see you. And the last words she said to me was, Son, I'll be waiting. She was talking about, we were talking about something totally different, completely different. But God prophetically had it to be just that way. She is waiting today. And by God's help and grace, I will see her. Would you bow your heads, please?